once the presentation happens. So um, I don't think we need too much pretext, but um, I'm assuming now is a fine time to start. And if people um, jump in, hopefully they can um, they can gain. Uh, they won't be too out out of it. So uh, <laughs> you can see um, I'm going to share some slides here. It's um it's a very detailed set of slides. Uh, originally, I had this uh, talk titled Deep Haven on the Fly, Spinning Up on Infrastructure on Demand with, with Fly.io. Um, but, but really, uh, I've got one slide here um, kind of describing what I'm hoping we can do. And it's, it's kind of me chatting with you. And for those of you who I haven't uh, met before, uh, my name is uh, Devin. Um, I've been at Deep Haven and previous iterations of Deep Haven for uh, over a decade. Um, I consider myself a core developer, um, but I like to, you know, experiment with new technologies and span the stack and, uh, you know, help people get things done. And part of today's um, topic is going to be trying to chat with you guys to figure out how how me as a developer and me as a, a developer operations guy uh, and the rest of the team can help us do our job better. Um, in, in I think one way that we're considering pushing forward there is spinning up some infrastructure for our own internal development purposes, whether that's for development, whether it's for research, uh, whether it's for general infrastructure that we need. Um, so, you know, we've got VMs that we can spin up. Um, maybe you, you guys have done that yourselves, maybe not. Um, you've probably seen our demo site and that's a public facing version of it. Um, but really what I'm looking at is how can we improve the velocity of our internal development, um, uh, research and infrastructure? Um, how can we reduce the friction um, and so some of the considerations here is, you know, you might want to uh, spin up an official Deep Haven core deployment. Uh, you might want to spin up a custom deployment. Um, you might want to have those things persist for a while. You might want to be able to spin up multiple ones ad hoc and take them down. Um, I mean, I think a really important consideration here is being able to do it ad hoc and be able to do it um, relatively fast. Um, is part of this infrastructure, some of the things you probably care about are shared storage, um, you know, either for large data sets or if, if somebody's working on a, a, a baseball data set and has some historical data for you, you know, reducing the amount of time if you want to show somebody else this data set, you don't want to have to have them download the data set, you know, maybe multiple gigabytes and spin it up locally and, you, you know, stuff like that and then shared services whether it's you know a deep haven barrage worker to worker publisher or maybe we want to have shared kafka services something like that so really that's what i want to spend a lot of time chatting with you guys about how you see workflows for using internal infrastructure for those purposes um and i'm going to specifically talk about kind of a a sprint that I've done down Fly.io. I'm going to talk about some of the good things, some of the bad things. I, I, I don't think it's going to be the be-all, end-all solution, um, but I'll walk through um, some of the stuff I've done there and where it might be useful for us uh, at a personal development level and maybe in the future um, for some more of our internal development needs. Uh, that's to be determined. Um, but that's that's basically where I'm at right now. Um, so uh, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts right off the bat, how if you guys want to talk about workflows and how you use Deep Haven, if you, you know, use the demo site for purposes more than just demos, um, you know, I don't know how many of you have seen the enterprise um, system or have worked with the enterprise system, but they've got a um, a method there where they can spin up um, what they call BHS. Um, BHS is on the fly, big honking systems. And I think it takes a couple of minutes and you can get a deployment out there with custom code and stuff like that. So 
kind of what this is, is I'm, I'm trying to motivate that type of deployment model for our community development purposes. Um, I don't know if anybody has any comments or questions right off the bat. Um, maybe, maybe I'll pull some of the enterprise people and ask them, you know, how often they use BHSs, you know, do, how long do the deployments take? It's been a while since I've done them there. Um, if, if anybody from the enterprise side wants to chime in. Sure. So, um, I tend to, I tend to split my work between BHSs and, and local work. Um, for for regular development, when I can do stuff with smaller data sets, I'll run it on on my local machine. But um, if I if I need to pull in the the bigger data sets, which is kind of one of the things you were saying right about having to download huge data sets, but um, like when I need to use some of our um, internal market data or or other stuff, or I'm trying to I'm trying to get my system to look more like a multi-node production system, then I will use the BHS and our and our uh, enterprise. Uh, um, BHS deployment and cluster setup stuff to facilitate all that. Um, how long is a, t a typical deployment for new code to a BHS? Um, if you want to, so do there's a, a couple. Of, yeah, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, so if you're if you're if you let's say you don't have a BHS at all and you want to spin one up from scratch, maybe alongside another BHS so that you can compare them. Um, starting fresh, where you just tell, you tell our, our Jenkins instance to go and make a VM, it takes about 15 minutes to provision the VM, set it up, install it, configure the mounts. It does all that automatically. Um, if you already have a VM that's up and ready to go, deployment only takes about three to five minutes. Um, and then the third way you can do it is by just pushing updated um, packages to it, and that can take even less. That can take, you know, 30, 40 seconds. It depends on what you're trying to do. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine um, how useful a tool can be unless you've used that tool before um, but I do want to motivate for all the community members who haven't been able to spin up their own infrastructure in a fast manner that it can be really powerful and I think as soon as you start combining it with shared storage and sh shared services and fast iteration it, it becomes kind of an invaluable tool um, for your own testing purposes or for your own research purposes um, so I just, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through a quick model that I've set up on fly.io. Again, this isn't, this isn't me um, blazing the way for what we're actually going to do, but it's, it's, I want you to see kind of the workflows that I'm using um, and kind of imagine how you might use it for your own purposes, whether that's core development or research or subscribing to external data or something like that. So um, I'm going to jump over to the command line here. Um, it's a little less visual, um, but hopefully um, it can it can demonstrate kind of what I've um, been doing here. Um, and if for those of you who saw my um, demo last Friday, it's going to be similar. Um, hopefully we have a little bit more time here uh, and I won't be as rushed. Um, and I've got a little bit more experience with it, um, but it is going to be um, kind of in the same spirit there. Um, can everybody see my terminal here? Can you zoom in a little? Yeah. Let me go. Let's go like that. I don't know if that's um, that good enough. Good. That looks good. Okay, so so... I'm going to go over the structure of what fly.io expects. Um, I, I guess I should talk about what fly.io is first. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen some of the blog posts, they have some really good content. Um, I think they're operating in an interesting space where there are these huge cloud vendors that are well-established, Google Cloud, you know, AWS, Azure, 
Um, and, and, and they come at it with an interesting approach and they have some differentiators that make them interesting. Um, first of all, um, they, they basically only accept Docker images, but they're actually not running Docker. Um, they unpack your Docker image into what they call a micro VM and deploy that. Um, they've made some really interesting choices around networking between containers and networking publicly. Uh, and they made some really interesting decisions around scale out and um, and what they call any cast. And so that's allowing uh, machines in different parts of the world to advertise the same IP address. And so those are kind of um, opinionated differentiators between the other cloud providers. Um, and it, they, they make it really easy to do here. Um, it's not actually the best model for maybe a deep haven internal um, deployment system, but it is very interesting. And I think it's it's potentially um, a very interesting model um, if we're considering publishing public data. Um, I think we've got a long way to get to that, um, but it's something I do want to try to motivate a little bit. Uh, but let's go over the structure of this. So basically there is uh, two things that are important for launching a fly. Um, app. Uh, one is a Docker file describing what you want to launch. And the second thing is a fly.toml um, that is going to describe um, the structure of, of what you want to launch a little bit. So, so um, here's the fly.toml. It's their own structure. Um, you can set environment variables and then tell it about the service. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create a Docker file. Um, this is the uh, entirety of the Docker file right here. Um, I've got a custom deployment that I'm calling Fly Jetty. It's basically our Deep Haven server build um, with a couple of changes to make it a little bit more applicable for Fly Jetty. Um, this, you know, in the future, this could be um, our Deep Haven server official deployments. Um, and then basically, I'm just copying the application directory here. Um, so it's it's a very simple Docker file. Um, it's extending almost from our exact release image, um, and, and and so that's kind of a very simple model for deployment. Um, if we look in our application directory, um, for those of you don't who don't app don't know what application mode is, this is something that'll start up a script on startup. Um, and so I've gone ahead and defined an application here that I want to run. Um, Actually, I am on the wrong. I'm on the wrong thing. I want to go to a producer site first. Sorry. So it looks very similar from over here. Um, and I lied. This Docker file is going to be a little bit uh, more complicated, and I can I can describe why here. If we look at this Docker file, um, I've kind of had to self manage a little bit of shared storage here via a fuse mount, and so that's what this is right here. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think fly.io is, is kind of interesting. Um, it makes it really easy to do a lot of, own, of your own custom stuff, um, but then it doesn't have some of the niceties that um, like uh, Google Cloud or AWS might have around shared storage. So I've spun up another service um, that is running uh, at this port and I'm just mounting it here. Uh, to the box, but then I'm doing the same thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm mounting this application. So let's go ahead and see what this application is. Um, I am just uh, getting some information about the box. Um, I am reading in a CSV and I am reading in a Parquet file. Uh, so to go ahead and get started here, um, what we'll do is I'm gonna go ahead and launch it. So so again, it's 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 literally these two files and this application directory that I've defined. I'm going to go ahead and go, I'm going to go ahead and launch it um, and saying it's found in an existing uh, application. I'm going to say yes. And that's just the Toml file that found and I want to name it. Let's call it Deep Haven Producer. Um, select my organization. I've got my personal thing, up, but I'm going to go ahead and deploy it um, with Deep Haven. Um, and then the other interesting thing is it's really easy to, to to select where you want to deploy it at. 
um, right here, I am closest to Seattle because I'm in Oregon. So I will, uh, will select Seattle. Um, it gives <laughs> the launch ask you if you want to watch a Postgres database. Um, no, I don't want a Postgres database. Uh, that's one of those, you know, opinionated choices where they're trying to push Postgres, but that's fine. So um, there we go. We've created the configuration. We haven't deployed it yet. Um, if we look at the um, the Toml file, I am giving it um, almost two gigabytes of heap. Um, so one thing I have to do is I need to scale um, memory. Um, I want to make sure I have 2048 uh, megabytes of memory before I deploy. And I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and uh, deploy that. Um, hopefully this works. I haven't deployed this specific service yet. Um, and there we go. So it ran this uh, remotely. Um, it notices that this it, it can share some of this infrastructure um, that I've already pushed to here, uh, and it's creating a deployment for me. So I can actually control C out of here right now and look at some logs. Uh, we can see what's going on here for this instance. Um, and we can see that we've already got our uh, server up and running. Um, and it looks like the port has started on 10,000. So you can see that was going from, you know, from a Docker file and from a Toml file up to having infrastructure in, you know, less than a minute basically. Um, let's go ahead and just so we can see, um, let's edit the application real quick. Um, right here, oops. And let's, um, let's just add a new column onto here um, and we'll just call it string column, hello, and we'll go world. Um, I think that is correct. So we'll go ahead and we're going to go ahead and all you have to do is do a fly CTL deploy. It'll um, notice the differences. Um, I should actually put in remote only and make sure that it doesn't build locally. It'll push everything remotely. So we'll go ahead and uh, run this deploy real quick. It's waiting for the remote builder. Um, pushing the context and it's building it up and it, it's almost all the same except for that application mode. So there's only one new layer to the image. Um, creating a release. Um, and so what we can do is, is I'm gonna control C out of here. And then what we can do is we can watch the logs and we can kind of see things happen in real time. It's uh, bringing up the new instance. We can see it's maybe if you saw that real quick, it's, it's launching with our new code. Um, and there we go, we've got it started on port 10,000. Um, so what we can do here is we can look at the status of it as well. Um, looks like uh, it's running. Um, we've got some health checks, I believe, and they're passing. Uh, and, and just to show you that um, we've got a real VM here and we can connect to it, I am going to jump over to it. Um, DPave, it's, it produces this URL for us. I'm gonna jump screens here. Um, if we jump over here real quickly, we can see this is this producer one actually is an old instance. I don't care about it anymore. I should actually uh, delete it. But this is the instance that we just um, we just pushed. Uh, it's been up for a minute. Um, there's a lot of interesting metrics here. We can see the logs from the browser. It shut down the old instance and we've only got the new instance. Um, but if we go ahead and go to this URL right here, hopefully um, it all works. And there we go. We've got a deep haven instance on the fly spun up in about a minute and then redeployed. Uh, and we can pull down um, some of this application mode stuff. So here is um, the fly info table that we've just produced with uh, hello world as a new column we just launched. Um, here is a file that was pulled in from shared storage using uh, CSV. Um, and here is a Parquet file uh, using shared storage. 
uh, it might not be as fast as you're used to locally, um, just because it is doing kind of a remote lookup against um, a file system. But if we navigate somewhere, it's not too much of a delay. It's maybe half of a second for random access, um, which is not too bad. So we could jump around here. Um, if we wanted to see how fast it is to sum over all these 100 million rows, we could go, let's do like a, okay, 100 million sum equals, okay, 100 million sum by, um, let's see. So this is kind of, you know, a shared storage. It's not a local storage. Um, it's still happening remotely. Um, takes about, what was that, about seven seconds or so. So not too bad. Uh, to go over 100 million rows. Um, so so let me take this a step further. Um, I want to show a little bit of what I think makes Flyout interesting for a public publisher. Um, and that is is kind of um, um, subscribing to these um, uh, an internal service and then republishing it. Um, so let's go ahead and stop presenting here and I will represent my terminal. Um, so this was the producer app. We've got it up and running. Um, it is just just for reference one more time. Um, it is it is basically running this on startup and, and that's about it. Um, if we go to a publisher side, um, this was, it's a little bit simpler. I am not using any shared storage. I just want to start up a VM. Um, let's go ahead and before we create this, let's go ahead and um, look at what we're doing right here. Um, very similar. We're just getting some fly info, but instead of subscribing to or, or reading a CSV and reading a parquet file, we don't have any local storage here. Um, so what we have to do is we have to um, subscribe. And actually, this is a different name right here. It's dphaven-producer. Uh, and when you're in the internal network, you can refer to stuff with this .internal domain. So we're gonna go dphaven-producer.internal, port 10,000. We're gonna get out the fly info from here, and we're gonna get out the CSV that we read here. Again, because we don't have shared storage on this box, at least the way I've set it up right now. Uh, so just like before, what we should be able to do is we should be able to go fly CTL deploy. It's going to give us, oops, I think, don't think this is what I want. Maybe I forgot to destroy this earlier. Yes, destroy. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, so let's launch a new one. I'd like to copy this configuration. Um, let's call it Deep Haven. The other one was called Producer. This one's going to be called Publisher. Uh, we're going to do it in the Deep Haven organization. Uh, we're going to choose Seattle first, but um, I'm going to show you a way to scale that out in a second. Um, don't want a Postgres database, no thanks, and let's not deploy now. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to set my memory to uh, two gigabytes. And then what I'm going to do is deploy remote only. Uh, so it's using that builder remotely. It is pushing and it's noticing it's sharing a lot of the same image layers as some of the other stuff we pushed. Uh, so it's a relatively fast build process. Um, it's creating the release. And as soon as it says I can control C out of this, I will. So I'm gonna go ahead and look at the logs here. There we go. Uh, starting up our uh, VM. Um, uh, launched our startup script and all right. So we've we've started uh, another VM in about less than a minute. It's running this and it's resolving some internal URIs for us. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, before I jump to the browser, 
I'm going to, I'm going to show you guys uh, an instance of scaling out. Um, um, FlyCTL has a lot of um, regions available, uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and add some other regions besides Seattle. I'm going to add um, Chicago. Regions add um, Toronto. Let's go ahead and add Toronto, and um, let's just let's just leave it at that. Chicago and Toronto, and then what we can do. We can still see we've got one instance running here in Seattle. Um, but let's say that we want to run one instance in each region. And so what that would basically do is anybody who's connecting to this uh, URL uh, will get the one that's closest to them. Um, so what I'm going to do here is scale. Um, I'm going to go, how do I do it? Scale count. Do it. Max per region. That's what I'm looking for. Fly CTL scale count three max per region one. Um, um, so hopefully we will see a new deployment take root here. I'm not sure if I actually need to redeploy or not. There we go. So, so we had one instance running in Seattle. Uh, now we've got one spinning up in Toronto and one shortly uh, in Chicago. Um, uh, we could see that the um, Chicago one is up and running. Um, Start in port 10,000, so that's all good. And it looks like the Toronto one is up and running as well. So let's jump back over to the browser. Um, wait, that's this one. So here's our producer. Um, let's just jump to the, oh, let me wait until my screen's scared. So this is the publisher uh, and hopefully this all works. Mm, that did not work, so that's not good. Deep Haven not secure. This is one of the issues with trying to uh, spin up stuff on the fly. Sometimes it does uh, not work as planned. So let's go look at the dashboard here. We've got a producer, Deep Haven producer, that's, or publisher, sorry. Um, I've got three instances. Um, maybe I have the wrong. I wonder if I can get access to the internal domain real quick. So this isn't as satisfying because I am connecting to the internal domain here instead of the publicly available one. Um, but hopefully this can show that um, we are um, running correctly here. And so this is our own fly info. Um, we were, oh, looks like I'm connected to the Chicago region when I'm going to the internal IP address right here. Um, we can get the remote fly info and so we can see that this one is coming from Seattle and we can see that um, we have successfully done a barrage worker to worker um, subscription to this um, URI that was published. So a um, little bit of hiccups with scaling out, um, but I think it's potentially a really powerful thing to have the uh, publishers of public data um, kind of at edge data centers as close to your users as possible. Um, so that's kind of a quick demonstration of fly um, where I think it's potentially uh, powerful. I mean, you saw how fast it was to uh, basically spin up a VM. Um, it's, you know, part of that though is it's just as easy to tear them down. Um, but hopefully you um, could imagine how you might be able to use this yourself to spin up stuff really quickly. Um, 
you know, if there's any questions, um, if people are interested in, um, you know, I've got I've got some files that should make it really easy to deploy stuff like this on your own. Uh, if you were interested, we could get you set up with the Deep Haven organization. I mean, ultimately, I think my goal was to have a more productionized internal, um, you know, shared uh, system that we could all use. It's not quite there yet. It, I mean, it's not there at all yet. Um, this is kind of a proof of concept, I think, for some of those concepts. It's lacking in some ways, but it's interesting in other ways. Um, but if you are personally interested in learning more about fly.io and getting some stuff up there quickly for your own research um, or development purposes, um, I think it's pretty straightforward. If you're you know comfortable on the command line um, and playing around with configuration files a little bit, um, but there's nothing you know quite out of the box ready to just you know hit a button and go yet. Um, but I'm hoping to get there uh, sometime. So which, which cloud is this being run on? And also for the the shared storage, how, how is that working? Yeah, so well, I can um, jump into that a little bit here. So fly.io maintains their own um, servers and their own data centers around the world. So they're not in an AWS VM and they're not in a GCP VM. Um, I don't know specifically what data centers they're in, um, but if we look at regions there I think in um, 20 it looks like 21 regions so a lot in the United States some in Europe some in Asia some in Canada uh, some in S uh, South America I believe too so um, you know I bet part of their business model is scaling this out more because they they really are I think targeted towards edge applications and moving data closer to users which I think is you know, when we present public data to users, I think that's going to be a big part um, of what we might end up needing to do. Um, and as far as what the storage is, um, I've got an instance here called uh, Deep Seaweed. Um, this is a filer um, slash fuse um, system that's based off of Seaweed FS. Um, it's a project um, that is pretty popular that makes it easy for blob object file uh, storage and stuff like that. Um, there's web dev, there's fuse mounts, you can get a S3 API. Um, you know, this is one of the places where it would be great if fly.io had something built in to do something like that. Uh, when you're doing something like this on GCP or AWS, they've got built in NFS servers that you can spin up and stuff like that. Um, but here I kind of had to roll my own. Um, you know, the good news is it was really, really easy for me to do. Um, but now, you know, there's some administration that we have to do uh, to be able to get these features. Um, but if we look at deep seaweed internal, um, this is kind of the internal storage right here. Um, I've got a parquet file right here, um, some different parquet files, and this is what we were pulling from um and then i had this uh shared csv right here that um, the the producer was pulling from um so there's a lot of potential to run whatever you want on fly.io for better or for worse um you, you know in this case um it might have been better to have something out of the box for shared storage um but on the flip side it's from a developer's perspective, it's nice to be able to spin up a VM from a Docker image in less than a minute. Um, and I think that's where it kind of beats um, some of the other some of the other uh, cloud managed services. Can we, um, can we can we actually just double click on that? Like uh, spinning up GCP from a container is I assume very, very, very well supported, right? Can you can you can you give a little depth as to why you think it's better with Fly.io versus the others? I mean, 
a part of it is they make the networking really easy. Um, you know, Fly.io has made a few opinionated choices that I think makes it really easy to get started. Um, and it's it's a differentiator between them and Google Cloud. So um, this is kind of a, a point that I brushed over a little bit, um, but these are publicly available URLs right now. Any of you would be able to go hit this public URL. Um, I'm, um, let's see if the other side of this is publicly available yet. Okay, so the publisher side is uh, publicly available, at least for me now too. Um, and I'm getting Seattle. Um, if you go to this URL, you're probably going to get a different region than Seattle, unless Seattle's your closest region. Um, but where they make it different, again, is is it's it's automatically publicly available, um, which which we might say is not what we want right now for our internal development purposes. Um, but one of the things our developers are working on right now um, is authentication and authorization. Um, so it's it's really nice to be able to, you know, not have to deal with VPNs, not have to deal um, with publicly exposing Google Cloud stuff, because it kind of comes like this out of the box with Fly. Um, Again, it's an unsecured instance, <laughs> again, because okay. anybody, anybody can so, get these right now. So I think I'm, I think I'm, what I'm hearing is, look, you can probably, you can deploy containers in other clouds readily. Maybe this is one minute and that's two minutes. I'm sure, I'm sure it's not one minute versus sure. 30 minutes, right? Um, but, but I, but hey, in the public cloud, you need to jump through hoops to, you know, get publicly accessible you know, uh, hooks, and it sounds like the default here because the choices they made is sort of the opposite. You probably need to opt in to put it behind a VPN, right? Correct. Um, okay, that's cool. Then the other question I have is just in regards to edge distribution. So the public clouds have a few regions, let's say, I mean, I don't know, six um, in the US, obviously, or they three in the US, and then some like they don't have, I'm not saying they have 42, but they have lots of regions, one. Yeah. Um, and, and, and maybe, and you can opt into where that's going to be, but then also even just from a, let's say there's 50 regions for fly IO in the U S and only one for Amazon. I'm making it up going to the extreme. Yeah. How do I, how do I think about that edge? Like, like, okay. Data distribution from let's, let's just make it up. If the, the, if it was from AWS in the center of the country, Best case scenario is probably going to be 15 milliseconds of distribution latency. They probably have all sorts of networking hops and non-optimizations. So let's say it's 150 milliseconds of network latency. Is that the way I'm supposed to think about it? Like, oh, if you could, if you could have your data in one of 50 fly IOs and more yep. or less take away that central distribution, yep. you gain you gain 100. 50 milliseconds one way each time it's, is that is that the advantage part of it yes um the other part is you are in some ways getting load balancing for free right when you have a centralized instance um you're responsible for scaling up your load balancer and your single instance um you know compute by itself um when you are deploying to edge regions you you, you kind of get a poor man's scaling up for free because if you have you know a million users requesting the service um you've only got a hundred thousand at each edge location let's say so th that's one difference too um you know there there might be uh overall throughput differences as well not just latency differences it might be the case that when you're closer to the edge and when you're getting your, you know, your your TCP sends and acts and stuff like that um, quicker, you're, it's not just your latency that might improve or is going to improve. It might be your total throughput. And again, maybe that's something we don't care about um, right now. Um, you know, maybe there are data sets that we care about or there might be data sets for other people for their own internal purposes where they care about pushing the data to the edge before they 
um, you know, have downstream consumers of it. Um, the yeah. other, the other really interesting thing that's technically different about um, Fly that I think is possible on the cloud providers, but I don't think it's easy at all, um, is called AnyCast. Um, so if we look at Fly.io AnyCast, so AnyCast is a really interesting. Um, interesting notion. Typically, typically the way that routing works on the internet is one IP address is associated with one physical server. And that physical server a lot of times is a reverse proxy um, that goes to, to individual instances as a single load balancer. Um, but there's another notion um, that CDNs and edge distributors use um, called AnyCast. Let's see if I can find that right here. Um, um, but basically what it does is it says, I'm gonna assign you a single IP address that anybody in the world can resolve. So, you know, dpaven.producer.fly.dev has an IP address behind it. dpaven.publisher.fly.dev has a different IP address behind it. But that IP address is being broadcast by all of fly.io's data centers via BGP AnyCast. And so that's how you get your edge distribution. Like you don't have to type like seattle.dpaven.dpavenpublisher.fly.dev, right? You don't need to type chicago.dpaven.publisher.fly.dev. Like this IP address that backs this um, is a single IP address um, that is routed via AnyCast BGP, which is a low layer TCP, um, uh, you know, it's a network backbone type thing that fly.io makes really, really easy. And I think you can do it via, um, you know, Google Cloud or AWS, but I don't think they make that very easy. Um, and it kind of comes with every VM you get here out of the box. And, and again, that's one of the opinionated decisions that fly.io has made. And maybe it's not the right, you know, maybe it's a feature that we really don't care about for internal purposes. Um, but I think once you start publishing data, it's it's a very it's a very attractive feature because you don't have to it, it's well configured out of the box for that. So my last question is, and I assume the answer is you don't know, but you don't know do you know anything about how they price data ingress and egress relative to the big players? That is a good question. Um, they have some documentation on it. Um, and maybe we can, um, I don't have good comparison. Yeah, we're not gonna, I mean, right yeah, now. I don't know. Um, looks like it's two cents per gigabyte. Um, I don't know how that compares to the other ones. Um, I mean, we could, we could work that's that. similar. That's similar, um, okay. So, um, yeah. And I mean, the other thing, that you're getting for free is SSL certificates out of the box here via a reverse proxy. So, I mean, they do a lot of things for you that you might want for um, a public website or something like that. Again, we probably don't want some of our, you know, internal infrastructure, you know, public facing, but for development purposes, and at least for me spinning stuff up, it's, you know, very handy to be able to get access to this stuff quick and easy without having a bunch of VPNs to configure or, you know, SSL certificates to configure and stuff like that. So. Oh. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm hoping that we can move the DH, um, the DH community, um, you know, developers and, you know, have JJ and Jacob um, and myself and anybody else who wants to deploy either a custom, some custom deep haven code or one of our deep haven core releases. Like I'm hoping to make it as easy as I just demonstrated. You know, I want to deploy an application mode server and I want to be able to show it to other people and I want to be able to inherit from shared data. Um, or maybe I just want to spin up a VM for an hour or two and then tear it down because I want to. I want to 
investigate something and I don't want to spin it up locally, either because I don't have enough resources or it's a lot easier to get access to a, um, let's say a Kafka stream. Like you can imagine we could have a Kafka stream um, as part of some official infrastructure that's really easy to get access to. Um, and you could do it locally, but there's a lot more setup involved. So, I mean, I'm hoping that, you know, as develop a dev rails here, you can say, yeah, this looks really cool. And this is how I would use it. And I would spin up a VM, you know, once a day and I'd tear it down or really I want long run VMs or actually I want to spin up a dedicated server for my baseball stuff. And I just want to republish it to other internal users, right? Like there's a lot of different ways you can use infrastructure. Um, and I'm presenting a model here where I think what people want is to, to, um, kind of deploy their own code ad hoc. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's like a sliding scale of stuff you do ad hoc versus, you know, you know, you want to republish deep haven data or you want to rely on a more stable, you know, deep haven internal service for Kafka or something like that. So um, I'm, I'm hoping we can motivate um, DevRels to, to, to produce ideas and, and and tell us what what they want, and again, it's it, it's kind of hard to um, to potentially visualize some of this stuff if you haven't used it before. Um, but that's what I'm trying to motivate here. So one of the one of the things that you know the deep having community core is not only for just you know random people to use who come across it, but you know I know we've had instances where people that work with certain companies come across deep haven community core and they're like this is cool and you know obviously we want to get them to be enterprise customers eventually is this is something like this like say we can point someone like that to a deep haven examples repository with the framework to build up something like you've done with deep haven plus fly uh you know what would a deep haven examples repository like that with that kind of framework look like where someone can spin up shared resources and all the infrastructure that you've just described? I mean, that's a great question. I think that's uh, potentially a great use for this is um, instead of telling people to um, Docker compose stuff and download the examples themselves, we could package up examples with a little bit of fly infrastructure around them, either um, separately or as the de facto way that we show people something like this. And we can say, look, you can spin this up yourself and it's probably gonna take a minute. And it's probably, depending on the size of the VM you need, it's gonna cost, it's it's gonna be between free and $5 a month or something like that, right? Um, but they'll be able to get access to an example hopefully up and running on remote in infrastructure in five minutes. So I think that's an interesting idea is is packaging up something that people can easily deploy themselves, not locally, but remotely. Um, and that's a good point because I think I think the barrier to entry for a fly.io deployment is a lot less than it is on AWS or GCP. You know, even though AWS and GCP are a lot more popular, like I said, there's a lot of networking, there's a lot of VPN. Um, maybe what you say is AWS and GCP are secure by default and fly.io is public by default. Uh, and, and so it makes it potentially less secure by default, but you know, then there are maybe less barriers to entry for prototyping purposes. So, um, I mean, if, if if you personally want to um, uh, jigger some examples and say, let's let's package up an example and show how people can deploy it themselves, um, that would be pretty easy. Um, if we're talking about, um, we actually want to host the example content ourselves and, and just present it as a URI that somebody else can download wherever their instance may be, um, I, I I very much want to get there, and I'm hoping we can get there. And as soon as we have a good uh, public authentication or authorization where we can lock down our server and say, look, you can't run any custom code. You can just do a barrage worker-to-worker -worker subscription. I think publishing our own example data 
is great. And I would very much like to use something like this to potentially push it to edge locations. Um, you, you know, as Pete said, maybe that's overkill um, right now since we're not doing high volume or we're not particularly concerned about low latency. Um, but it's nice to have the option of kind of having this auto load balancing by pushing out to the edge. Um, and it could be, you know, it could be interesting blog content, right? Like here's how Deephaven pushes data to the edge or public data to the edge. Here's how you can do it for your own data. I think that's an interesting story to tell too. Um, so. Did you try using any of our client packages with a deep haven instance hosted on fly.io? Um, what packages are that? Like, like uh, the Pi client, Java client. Um, so the Java client gets implicitly used when you do a worker to worker subscription. <laughs> it's kind of hidden behind the scenes. Um, so, so I did do that. I haven't done it remotely to this instance, but I am betting um, it will work. Um, we can go ahead and um, I will go ahead and just share my terminal and uh, we'll see we'll see if it works. Um, so what we'll go here is what I'm going to do is um, clients. What are we doing? So let's do this. Java client. I've got a client. Let's let's give it this URL right here and see if it works. So let's see if we can connect the uh, Deep Haven Publisher via the Java client. Hey, there we go. It connected. So let's see what else we can do. Um, we can. Let's let's um, subscribe to the fields for this target. So there we go. So um, yeah, the the remote clients work. At least the Java That's client, nice. we're able to get the table data out. So I mean, I could, um, we could um, let's go to the let's go to the flight. Um, let's do a list. Real quick here, let's use this target. Let's use the list tables. Oops. Um, flight. What do we call it? Client flight examples. Let me build it real quick. Think about this. So there's um, a list tables or a list flights command. Um, we can also, let's go ahead and just subscribe to them. One of them, um, get table. Let's look at the command here. I believe we just do um, variable and let's get fly info um, and give it this target. Right. There we go. So we've got actually what's we want to get the I want to print it as a tab separated value. Oops. I forget exactly how um how I print it out to the screen here, but look, it got it. <laughs> it got it schema here. It's just not showing us uh the data because uh I forgot how to do that. Let's see. Take a look real quick. Um Anyways, yeah, so it looks like um, all, all the remote clients work against this. Um, we could look at the producer side and we could see the producer has a fly info table and you can see, there we go. So this is connecting to the producer side of it. Um, but yeah, the these are all publicly accessible URLs. Cool.
Um, if that's it, um, then, you know, unless there's any other questions, you know, hopefully this got you thinking about infrastructure. Um, I would like, you know, to, to move the infrastructure conversation forward a little bit more, hoping to professionalize it a little bit more. Again, I, you know, I don't know necessarily if fly.io um, is the right answer, um, but I, I wanted to demonstrate, you know, the power of being able to quickly spin up a VM in a shared environment. Um, and hopefully, hopefully we can get some tools out like this for ourselves. Um, so. All right. Devin. All right. All right. Well, thanks for showing up. Hopefully, if you guys have any questions or if you want to do some demonstration deployments on fly.io, let me know. Um, hopefully, we'll have something more professionalized in the future where you can just click a button and get your own VM or click a button and deploy your own VM with custom code or custom application stuff. So, All right. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.